With the Biden stimulus now law and COVID vaccinations hitting record pace, Biden White House, they're now fully focused on its $2 trillion infrastructure proposal. That proposal is, if you go by the polls, pretty popular. It's got majority support from all groups, including even Republicans, for all of these focuses, from highways to medical infrastructure to getting rid of lead pipes to schools, VA hospitals. No polling number here lower than 51%. And yet... President Biden still faces an uphill road to getting this passed. Republicans think they have a line of attack. They're saying despite all it does, the bill really isn't about infrastructure. It's just a multi-trillion dollar far left wish list, echoing the GOP's ongoing theme. And there are grumblings in corporate America about the corporate tax hike that Biden says he wants to pay for this. Even good news for the president on infrastructure it comes with a caveat. Senate parliamentarian just said that Democrats can pass this infrastructure bill through reconciliation, so they only need the 50 votes, the tie break and going to the vice president. But West Virginia's Joe Manchin, he's holding out again, so Democrats may really struggle to get to that 50 vote mark. They also may not have votes in the House. Now, Florida Democrat Alcee Hastings' recent passing leaves Democrats with only a seven seat majority under Nancy Pelosi. Late last week, a group of eight Democrats, seven of them from New York and New Jersey, wrote to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen saying they will not vote for the Biden infrastructure bill if it doesn't get rid of the SALT limits that cap federal write-offs for state and local tax payments. New York and New Jersey have some of the highest property taxes in the country. Our next guest, one of those members, threatened to block this infrastructure legislation. Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill, she's a Democrat, represents New Jersey's 11th district, which covers the north central part of the Garden State. Congresswoman, always appreciate the time. You know, um, today, uh, Governor Cuomo had his briefing, and he counted... Um, SALT getting repealed as part of the new budget for New York. Is that wishful thinking or are you also confident that at the end of the day this thing's going to go away? I feel really good about addressing SALT in the infrastructure bill um, because quite frankly it's not an either or. Um, this is a broad bill that can do both and we have to do both because we know New Jersey and New York are real economic engines of this country and if we're going to get past COVID, if we're going to get people back up on their feet, especially from a region of the country that was first and hardest hit, we've got to address infrastructure and we also have to address this punishing salt tax cap that has really hurt middle class families across my region. If it gets um, removed from um, uh, reality on one of those uh, taxpayers who's gotten banged by it. Is that the only holdup for you? Um, you and the others who echoed your concerns to uh, Secretary Yellen, you'll be on board then? Well, you and me both, uh, just about everyone around here seems to have gotten banged by it a little bit. Um, in fact, with the last year we have numbers, over half the people in my district took the state and local tax deduction. And so, it, it, as I said, it really is an important issue for middle class families. Um, but once we get that in the bill, which I think we will, I think when we look at the rest of the bill, it's a great infrastructure bill that invests in the future of this country. And so to, to somehow act like it's a democratic wish list, these are infrastructure projects that we've long been um, bipartisan across the nation, looking at investments in our crumbling infrastructure, especially around here when we're talking about the Gateway Tunnel Project, the nation's most important infrastructure project. But beyond that, we're looking at making our electric power grid more resilient. Believe me, I have Republican mayors up in uh, the, out in the western part of my district that would very much like to see that because of the, the problems we've had through the last several storm seasons. Um, we look at things like investing in green power. I was just on with my union at the AFL-CIO this morning talking about some of those great jobs that are non-portable jobs, jobs that would stay right here in New Jersey um, with our offshore wind investment. So these are a lot of the things we're talking about and a lot of the things we're going to address in this infrastructure plan. You know, let's stay in district for a minute. And this isn't limited to obviously your district, but to a lot of the northeastern states. Um, I showed the polling. It's popular um, what President Biden is proposing. But there's a price tag for it, and he says it's high time that the richest who did particularly well in the last four years pay their fair share. But you've heard the same things that I have, that there's a breaking point um, where the well-off, not just in New Jersey, but in New York and, and other of the northeastern states will just say, too much, I'm out of here, you keep raising taxes on me. 
uh, you think that's talk or how worried are you it's reality? Well, I think that's something we're looking at um, constantly here in North Jersey. It's an affordability issue. I want to make sure that you can, um, <laughs> and this sounds great to us. I know people from other areas don't get it, but but you can be born here. You can live your life here. You can raise your kids here. You can retire here. You can die here. I mean, you can live a full, great life in New Jersey, and yet too many of our seniors um, are finding the, uh, the burden too high, the affordability issues too high. I've had a retired teacher come up to me and say, with this state and local tax deduction cap, I've got, you know, I'm on a fixed income and I've had a couple thousand more in taxes I had to pay that I can't afford. Um, we look at young people right out of a college. I got to tell you, as an ensign in the Navy, I never could have afforded to live in my town. So we do have a real affordability crisis in North Jersey. And again, the state and local tax deduction cap just adds to that tax burden. As you mentioned, uh, you're a veteran, um, and when you were on with this before, after the riots, um, more than just um, the the sadness and, and the outrage as to what happened, you were clear that this didn't just happen organically. Uh, the White House had some culpability, but you even uh, told us before that you had some open-ended questions about even some of your colleagues. Those members of Congress who had groups coming through the Capitol that I saw on January 5th, a reconnaissance for the next day. Those members of Congress that incited this violent crowd. Where are we right now as we're in April, Congresswoman? Uh, because sure, a 9-11 commission is great to, to get to the bottom as to what happened on that awful day and what led to it. But I, I keep thinking back to our conversation, what, how bizarre must it be to share a Congress with people who potentially aided and abetted one of the worst days in American history, um, are you getting answers quick enough as to if some of your colleagues, worse than look the other way, you know, may have given people tours that ended up, you know, storming your offices? Well, as I've said before, I've spoken to federal investigators. I know they're working very hard on that, but I do have some questions that are still unanswered. I have some concerns. I've read reports that some of the tapes might have been destroyed by the Capitol Police. I'd like to understand that a little bit better, um, understand a, a little bit more about the evidence available. And I'll tell you, I've also put forth um, legislation for a January 6th commission to not only study what happened that day, but the events that led up to that day. I was just with um, some diverse members of my community who, who want to know how we've gotten to this point. Why are so many members of our Asian community feeling so under threat? Um, why do we have these continuing problems that, that remain unaddressed, problems of racism across this country? Uh, we need to get to the bottom of, of how that was impacted by the events leading up to January 6th, because quite frankly, um, too many groups across this country are not feeling safe. Um, they, the diversity of this country, which I've always prized, especially as a New Jerseyan and knowing how it leads to such an innovative uh, country and economy, um, is really under threat and attack in too many places in this country. One of your colleagues um, uh, we spoke to earlier, uh, Congressman Cohen, uh, he's joined, uh, I believe it's up to 10 other um, Democratic members in the House that they're attaching a suit against Donald Trump for his role in the January 6th riots. And moreover, some of his comments subsequent to that, uh, which he says the rioters um, are being persecuted. What role do you think the president had? And do you think it's a, a good use of time here uh, that the courts investigate his culpability? I think the president of the United States of America, President Trump, incited a riot against members of Congress, myself included, who were in the Capitol performing our constitutional duty of certifying the election. And what's worse is, as people were attacking the Capitol, as we were being attacked, the president further incited the crowd with his continuing tweets, even against his own vice president. And so I do think that there's a role for the courts. I think there's certainly, though, a role for an investigation into what led to that day. And finally, um, there was an interesting uh, pact that's being set up to help uh, moderate uh, Democrats uh, coming up for next year's midterms. Are you comfortable with the direction of the party and the priorities right now? Uh, is it reflective 
um, of the broader party, or do you think it's gone too far on the progressive side? Um, I know we're only a few months into the Biden administration, but where the priorities are right now, is it in line with where you are? Look, if we're talking about priorities like those outlined in the American Rescue Plan, so making sure that our state and local governments are made whole. And again, I've heard from so many of my mayors, including my Republican mayors, about how desperately needed these funds were from the federal government, making sure they're not laying off teachers or cops or having to raise taxes at a horrible time uh, for people in my district. Um, if we're talking about making sure that kids can get back to school this fall at the latest, or making sure that we can get people vaccinated um, or tested, and, and, and making sure that all of America has the ability to move forward and, and get past the coronavirus, and then if we're going to invest in our nation's crumbling infrastructure and making sure that people have a job at the end of this pandemic and that families have that security, um, then I think we have the right priorities right now. Those are the priorities I've long held, investing in the people in this country and jobs and our economy and our future. And that's what Joe Biden has been focused on. Congresswoman, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Up next, we will stay in Congress, but on a much different subject, a colleague um, of our last guest, and he's under investigation for sex with a 17-year-old and possible sex trafficking. Colleagues say he has shared nude photo photos on the House floor, and no one, even in his own party, seems to like the guy. This week, it only went from bad to worse for Matt Gates. the latest on his unpardonable behavior, next.